we begin with the crucial midterm elections that are just 20 days away. And early voting begins today in three states, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Oregon. President Trump continues his media blitz Blitz is an understatement to push his party's candidates. The president admits he doesn't like speaking to journalists, but he wants to keep Republicans in power. This is just for the midterms. We want to win. We want to get the Republicans nominated and uh, we want to get them elected. We need Republicans. You know, they talk about majority. We have a majority of this much. He might not like speaking to journalists, but he does like speaking to some news hosts. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump told the Associated Press on Tuesday that he won't be to blame if Republicans lose control of the House, saying, quote, I think I'm helping people. We have had a very big impact. Some of the people I've endorsed have gone up 40 and 50 points just on the endorsement. Well, this all comes as new numbers show Democrats have a massive fundraising edge in the race for the House. According to the latest filings with the Federal Election Commission, Democratic candidates more than doubled GOP fundraising in the 108 districts considered the most competitive by the nonpartisan Cook Political Report. All right, joining us now to talk more about this, our dear friend Steve Karnacki, MSNBC national political correspondent. Steve, that argument that Democrats are making, they've outraged Republicans. I'm pretty sure the three of us have seen that movie. It was called the 2016 presidential mm -hmm. election. Raising money doesn't necessarily mean the fast track to winning. Uh, yeah, no, no question. Um, it does speak, it seems, especially because so many, so much of that money is coming from small dollar donations. It continues that theme we've been talking about a lot for the last year, uh, uh, Stephanie, just in terms of there being energy on the Democratic side. And the big question the last couple of weeks has been, is there comparable energy on the Republican side? Uh, let's talk about uh, races there. We, you know, we ca keep talking about Republican districts that Democrats are targeting. Is there another side to this? Are there are there Democratic uh, districts that Republicans are targeting that Democrats are actually worried about? Yeah, I think that's an interesting point to keep in mind because, of course, we've been saying this number 23 right. for so long. Now, Democrats need that net gain of 23 to pick up the House. It's very doable for them, and there are dozens of targets out there that they're going after. But if this is a close election night, if that's what emerges, there's another piece this puzzle at least to keep in mind and it is this there are some districts out there where republicans think they have a chance of doing to democrats what democrats are trying to do to them to flip democratic seats there are a couple of them this is probably the this counts as the exhaustive list here some of these might be real reaches but i'll give you an example here it'd be the eighth district of minnesota let's see if we can find there you go so this is geographically large duluth the iron range this is, uh, if you want to know, this is the home of Bob Dylan, by the way, from Duluth. He was born there uh, originally. But take a look at this. Jeez, if I can get this to work. Take a look at Our this district here. Loves Dylan. They, they changed up the uh, they changed up the thing. I'm, I got to get some more muscle memory here. But bottom line is here. We've talked so much about these districts that went from Obama to Trump. Look at the swing in this wow. district. Obama won it by six. Trump won it in a landslide by 16. It is a Democratic held congressional seat. The Democrat not running for reelection. Here is the matchup. And here is what the polling is showing us in this race. The Republican now out in front by 15 points. Democrats talking about pulling back maybe some of their financial efforts here. This would be, if it holds, this would be a Republican pickup. And so again, when we're talking about that magic number for Democrats being 23, if they lose in Minnesota 8, it could go to 24. If they lose down here in a very similar district in Minnesota, it could go to 25. Again, there are a lot more, a lot more Democratic targets than there are Republican targets on the math. But if the, a map, but if the accounting is tight on election night, right. these are the sorts of things that will come into play. And, uh, and uh, Kamala Harris and others have been warning that if turnout is low, uh, the, the, the low end of the projections actually show substantial Democratic gains in terms of the number of seats, but there is some scenario which doesn't show Democrats taking the House, even if they gain seats. And that is the question of if right. the Republicans so can they get, get their 22 energy. seats or something right. like that. And, and then, uh, boy, we'd be for quite a that drama That would be a that. successful night for Democrats, but if they don't take the House, uh, the mathematical success sort of gets wiped they, out. They're, yeah, they are, their expectations are on getting to that number 23 and past it. All right, Mr. Kanaki, thank you so much. Let's bring in Bill Crystal, editor-at-large of the Weekly Standard. All right, Bill, what's your take? President Trump says if Republicans don't pull this off, it will not be his fault. He's created quite a, quite a swell of enthusiasm, at least in the last few weeks. Take a listen. We have great poll numbers. We have tremendous turnout at these rallies. I think we have a lot of enthusiasm. You know, I keep hearing about the enthusiasm, the blue wave, yeah. but I think we have tremendous enthusiasm. 
Uh, so, Bill, look, it's not atypical for President Trump to say if something works, it's his, uh, it's his doing, and if something doesn't work, it's somebody else's fault. Uh, but let's talk about this GOP enthusiasm and its ties to Trump. I mean, so in a normal off-year election, when one party uh, controls the presidency in both houses, they lose about 30, 32 seats. So it's fair enough, to, if that's the result, for Trump to say, oh, it's just a normal thing, it doesn't reflect on me. On the other hand, on the other hand, the House, because of the nature of the districts, both gerrymandering and just the concentration of Democrats in some districts, uh, is naturally now Republican. It has been Republican for 20 of the last 24 years. So to lose the House is a bit of an achievement, I would say, or to gain the House for the Democrats is a bit of an achievement. Uh, to lose it is a bit of a rebuke for Trump, especially if the reason the Republicans lose it, and I think this will be the, one of the key reasons, is a massive gender gap in suburban districts where a lot of voters who have voted Republican, where I live in Northern Virginia, uh, for example, for a congresswoman in our case, Barbara Comstock, if some of them swing and vote Democratic, that's not going to be because they suddenly changed their mind about Barbara Comstock. She's been a congresswoman for two, three terms and is well liked in the district, actually. It's because it's a repudiation of Trump. So I don't think Trump can quite get away, despite the historical average. If there's a huge gender gap, what's causing that? It's not just generic Republicanism, I don't think. It's Trump. All right, I want to talk for a moment about sort of this disappearance of the middle. There is a new report out. It's called Hidden Tribes. The research group uh, More in Common put it together. And it basically puts the nation's voters into seven distinct groups. And the most active are small, but they're the extremes. Progressive activists on the left, about 8% of voters. And devoted conservatives, about 6% on the right. Mm -hmm. Tiny groups, but that seem to be running the show. And David Brooks uh, had an amazing piece yesterday. And his takeaway was, quote, Quote, our political conflict is primarily a rich white civil war. It is between privileged progressives and privileged conservatives. Does that make sense to you? It does. Look, hyperpolarization and hyperpartisanship are problems which have a lot of different socioeconomic and more na you know, narrow political causes. But I wouldn't overdo it. You know, we elected a Democratic governor of Virginia last year. He's pretty moderate. I think he voted for Bush, actually, in 2004. Uh, in a lot of these congressional districts, these are re the Democrats, I think, intelligently or luckily, nominated reasonably moderate candidates here in Virginia, in my district, Virginia 10, also Virginia 7, where Allison Spanbarger, who worked for the CIA, is running against Dave Brad. I think of quite a likely upset there. So I don't quite buy that everything is so polarized that nothing can be done. Moderates need to organize better in both parties. They need to organize in the primaries so you don't get a choice mm -hmm. of two extremes. But I think we could end up with an uh, actually surprising number of moderate Democrats, fairly moderate Democrats perhaps, at least in the House this year. It's still a highly polarized moment and highly partisan moment, and Trump, of course, makes it, makes it even more so. Uh, it's hard to know what's going to happen. So, uh, Steve Bernanke was right to be cautious, I think. It, it's, there's a lot of cross-cutting currents in the polls, but it feels to me a little bit like it did in 94 and 2010, yeah. which were the two great wave elections. You got a bit of a bear market rally, let's call it, by the party in power in early mid-October. I remember this in 94, that Clinton was out on the stump, the Democrats didn't look as bad as it had right. looked, you know. And then the wave, the primary trend, kind of reasserts itself often in the last two or three weeks. It kind of feels to me like that might be happening. And in that case, the Democrats could go to a 40, 50 seat uh, win in the House, wow. and they could put the Senate in play. Allie, so, so. bear market rally. Bill yeah. Crystal cut I did that for you, Steph. I did that for you. I did that for you, Steph. So when you talk to regular uh, uh, folks uh, who are voters, who are going to be voters, economics uh, plays high on the list of major concerns, which is interesting given that we've got such low unemployment. Uh, but uh, one of the things that uh, Democrats are really taking seriously is discussing health care, what they're going to do about Obamacare. They've been talking about this uh, for two years now. The New York Times is reporting that Republicans are suddenly running ads about pre-existing conditions and protecting them. Uh, kind of weird. Scott uh, Walker is doing this. Um, as well. Is running on part of Obamacare a good strategy for a Republican Party that worked very hard to eliminate it? Well, I think it opens them up to a counterattack. It's a defensive maneuver, but I think what the polls are showing and the focus groups are showing, pre existing conditions is powerful. The Republicans want to take away your health care, true or false, frankly, or exaggerated, let's say, is powerful. And I do think the debt, we just got those numbers with the debt up 17% yep. this past year, most partly due to the Republican tax bill, and the notion that the next Republican Congress, if you put Republicans back in power, might cut Social Security or Medicare, or let's be more 
uh, clear or you know, cut the reduce the rate of increase, perhaps in mm -hmm. Social Security and Medicare in future years. That gives Democrats some pretty good issues to run on: pre-existing conditions in health care. Republicans are running up the debt irresponsibly, and they threaten your Social Security and Medicare. If I were a Democratic candidate going into the final three weeks, I would hammer at those bread and butter issues. Leave aside a lot of the culture war yep. stuff. I think those will appeal to independent voters. Bill Crystal, weren't you a conservative once? <laughs> I still am. I'm just being analytical here. Hey, MSNBC fans, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down there and click on any of the videos here to watch the latest interviews and highlights. You can get more MSNBC for free every day with our newsletters. Just visit msnbc.com newsletters to sign up now.